Hi everyone. Today we are moving on to the second part of the first chapter, electric charges and fields. In the previous class, we already discussed some uh, points that is introductory points, what are charges, what are properties of charges, etc. Now in the textbook, in the NCRT textbook, there are three problems to be discussed. So example 1, 1, 1, 2 and 1, 3 we will be discussing first and after that only we will be moving on to the next topic. These problems are very simple, simple ones but there are some concepts concepts to be clarified. So first uh, problem it is how to charge a metallic ball positively by induction. So the three methods of charging we already discussed uh, the method of conduction, induction and by rubbing. So by induction how can you charge a metallic sphere positively that is the question by induction. So it's very simple actually. First of all, you have to mount the metallic sphere on an insulating stand. So this is the metallic sphere mounted on an insulating stand. It is mounted on an insulating stand and nearer to. So this is to be charged positively. So nearer to this positively charged metallic sphere, you have to bring a negatively charged glass rod. So you bring a negatively charged glass rod or whatever you have. The thing is this, that object should have negative charge. So when you bring, so it's not touching, it's not by conduction, it's by induction. Okay, so there is no physical contact, just nearer to it we have brought it. So the charges, that means in a metallic conductor, you know, valence electrons are free. Those valence electrons will be repelled from this side because this object is having negative charge. So those electrons will get repelled. So electrons will move to this side. The electrons will move to this side. So consequently a positive charge, an equal amount of positive charge appears on this side of metallic sphere. Okay, so a local rearrangement of charges takes place within the metal sphere because of the presence of this negatively charged body. Okay, now what we are doing next is, so first step is to mount it on an insulating stand. Second step, bringing a negatively charged body. Okay, in the third step, this side where negative charges are accumulated, there we will earth it. Okay, by earthing or grounding, we are grounding it. So the thing is this, these electrons because earth means grounding or ground means it will absorb whatever charges it gets. So these electrons will be earthed by this earthing wire. That means these negative charges, it disappears. Okay, it disappears. So we remove after that earthing, we remove this earth wire also. Okay, so we earthed this side so that negative charge disappears and earthing wire also we removed. So now this metallic sphere is having a net to positive charge. Before that its net to charge was zero because only a rearrangement on either side was taking place. Okay, positive charges one side, negative charges the other side but some of the charges is zero, again zero. So it was neutral but now it is having net to positive charge. Now afterwards we will remove this negatively charged body also. So by that this charges, an amount of positive charges here no. So I have already mentioned what is the property of metals or conductors. The charge gets equally distributed over the surface. The charge gets equally distributed over the surface. So these charges they get equally distributed over the surface. This is how we have a uniformly charged sphere by the method of induction. So that is the answer to the first question. Okay, now in this question I used a word earthing. So I said earth is a, it can absorb all the charges. So it is a universal acceptor actually, earth. Okay, so we make use of this earthing in our household wiring system also we make use of earthing. I think you know it. Hmm? 
so you might have seen that thick wires which which is buried deep into earth okay in a big pit <coughs> it will be going into so that is for the purpose of earthing and why it is to be earthed there are two purposes of providing earthing the first thing is to provide safety for the people who handle uh, what equipments or devices with the metallic coverings okay that is first thing second thing is to protect the device from excess current and all okay or the thing is this in earth wire system that means wiring system household wiring system where we use different electrical <coughs> appliances we have three wires live wire neutral wire and earth wire okay in plugs and all you might have seen three pin plugs okay two are four two on the same level they are one for live and the other four neutral and the big one on the top big one that means it is having th more thickness and more length also that is for earthing okay so in the wiring system also this earth wire will be connected so the thing is this earth wire is connected means chosen in such a way that it is having a resistance which is less than the resistance of the human body okay so earth wire is having a resistance which is less than the resistance of human body because human body is a good conductor of electricity so this earth wire should have a resistance which is less than the resistance of human body so when uh, uh, in handling suppose we take the example of ironing pressing pressing the clothes while pressing the clothes by chance this live wire if it comes into contact with the metallic part of the uh, what iron box okay so that moment itself that metallic covering will be connected to earth wire system with the presence of that three pin it will be connected to earth wire so that moment itself so if even if we touch no since the earth wire is having low resistance compared to our body that current will be flowing through which wire earth wire it may not flow through our body it will flow through that earth wire only by that way that excess current will be given to earth that way the human um, who is handling or the person who is handling that device will be safe so for these two purposes we use that earth wire system at home so that word earthing came in that problem no that's why i explained this earthing okay now that's all now coming to the second problem in second problem it's given see electrons it's given 10 raised to 9 electrons flow electrons okay electrons they flow from one object to another object from one body to another body 10 raised to 9 electrons are flowing in one second did you understand uh, from one body to another body 10 raised to 9 electrons are flowing in one second in one second 10 raised to 9 electrons in that way how much time it takes so that this body so this is first body this is the second body the second body gains a charge of one coulomb so for that how much time it takes if in one second 10 raised to 9 electrons are being transferred this is what is the question is this is very simple let's do what it is so in one second 10 raised to 9 okay you know what is the charge of one electron charge of one electron it is 1.6 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb okay so to make one coulomb how many electrons should be there to make one electron one coulomb in one coulomb 1 by 1.6 into 10 raised to minus 19 electrons should be there so number of electrons in one coulomb is equal to 1 by 1.6 into 10 raised to minus 19 and this is the same as 6.25 into 10 raised to 18 so this is the number of electron which constitute what one coulomb so 
to get to one coulomb how many electrons are to be transferred this many electrons at what rate it is getting transferred in one second 10 raised to 9 so how many seconds it takes to transfer electrons what how many this many electrons are to be transferred so time taken t is equal to 6.25 into 10 raised to 18 divided by 10 raised to 9 because in one second 10 raised to 9 electrons are transferred no so that is divided by 10 raised to 9 so what we get is 6.25 into 10 raised to 9 second this many seconds are needed to uh, give a charge one coulomb to the second body Okay, if the charge is transferred at the rate 10 raised to 9 in 1, 10 raised to 9 electrons in 1 second. So, this is given in second, we don't know how much it is. So, we will convert it into years. To convert it into years, what we need to do? Divide it with 1 year. 1 year means what? 365 days. 1 day is 24 hours. 1 hour is 60 minute and 1 minute is 60 second that means this number is to be divided this value is to be divided with this value so when we do this calculation no we will get 198 years what we get is 198 years or approximately we say 200 years so how much time it takes you just imagine if in one second 10 raised to 9 electrons are transferred to make it one coulomb it takes 200 years so this problem it uh, points points out one important thing that is coulomb is a bigger unit of charge we said si unit of charge is coulomb but coulomb is a bigger unit of charge okay so from this problem actually that is the point which we need to keep in our mind that is coulomb is a bigger unit of charge so we use smaller units of charges like uh, micro coulomb nano coulomb okay pico coulomb whatever it is okay we can use smaller units so micro coulomb means what 10 raised to minus 6 coulomb nano coulomb means 10 raised to minus 9 coulomb pico means what 10 raised to minus 12 coulomb like that it goes so there are some smaller units which we can use so in short coulomb is a bigger unit of charge so that's about that second problem now we will discuss that third problem third problem also is to show that coulomb is a bigger unit of charge okay that the third problem is uh, like uh, how, how much positive and negative charge is there in one cup of water. In one cup of water, in one cup of water, how many positive charge and negative charge? How much? Not number. It is asked how much? How much? In Coulomb, you have to state. Okay. So, what it is? So, one cup of water, no, we will take it to be... 250 gram of water we will assume it is 250 gram of water so basically chemically what it is water h2o h2o is the molecular formula for this water you know it so there are two hydrogen atoms and uh, one oxygen atom in one water molecule Okay, so let's discuss how many electrons are there all together in one molecule of water. How many electrons are there? In oxygen, there are 8. In one atom of oxygen, there are 8 electrons. And in one hydrogen, there is 1 electron. Okay, so 2 hydrogen atoms are there. So there are 2. So 2 plus 8 is equal to 10. So 10 electrons are there same amount so amount of negative charges is negative 10 electrons that means 10 electrons the same amount of positive charge also will be there so question is to find how much positive and negative charge is there in one cup of water 
so it's enough to find either positive or negative so it's easy for us to find the electron charge the same with the positive sign you can write as the positive amount of charge okay so there are 10 electrons in one molecule so how to do one electron charge we know so it's enough to find how many electrons are there in 250 gram of water okay and in uh, uh, 250 gram how many electrons are there multiply it with one electron charge you will get the negative charge the same as the positive charge okay so first we will find the number of electrons in 250 gram in one atom or in one molecule of water in one molecule of water there are 10 electrons so first we will determine how many molecules are there in 250 gram so in 250 gram how many molecules are there so for that we make use of one fact that is 18 gram is the gram molecular mass of water gram molecular mass is 18 gram so if it is like that what do you mean by that 18 gram of water consists of a Vogadro number of molecules okay that means in 18 gram this many molecules are there in 18 gram 6.02 into 10 raised to 23 molecules are there so in 1 gram how many molecules are there 6.02 into 10 raised to 23 divided by 18 okay so in 250 gram how many molecules are there 6.02 into 10 raised to 23 by 18 that is the number of molecules in 1 gram that into 250 will give you number of molecules in 250 gram you know in one molecule there are 10 electrons so number of electrons in 250 gram of water number of electrons in 250 gram of water how much it is this is to be multiplied with 10 that means 6.02 into 10 raised to 23 by 18 into 250 into 10 that is the number of electrons to get the amount of charge what is to be done this is to be multiplied with the charge of electron that is 1.6 into I am showing it here that is 1.6 into 10 raised to minus 19 so number of electrons it is to be multiplied with the charge of an electron and you will get the total amount of negative charge when you do the calculation you will get the answer to be 1.34 into 10 raised to 7 coulomb okay 10 raised to minus 9 minus 19 23 so how much we get is 1.34 into 10 raised to 7 coulomb of charge in 250 gram of water that is the amount of negative charge the same amount of positive charge also will be there now we discuss coulomb's law so coulomb's law it is a law it is actually a universal law it actually gives how the forces between two charges yes in previous class we already discussed the force between the two charges it can be attractive or repulsive depending on the type of charges if the light charges are there the force is repulsive if unlike charges are there the forces of attraction we already discussed now what is the magnitude of that force that is given by this coulomb's law so to start with coulomb's law we consider two charges suppose we have two charges separated by a distance r so the two point charges we are considering q1 and q2 and the two charges are separated by a distance r r is the distance between the two charges now according to coulomb's law the force between the two charges is directly proportional to magnitude of force let that magnitude of force be f 
that magnitude of force is directly proportional to product of charges that is q1 q2 product of charges q1 q2 and it is inversely proportional to square of distance between the two charges so we have f directly proportional to q1 q2 and f inversely proportional to r square so combining this we have f proportional to q1 q2 by r square f is proportional to q1 q2 by r square now removing the proportionality symbol we have f is equal to k into q1 q2 by r square so what is this k k is nothing but the proportionality constant so f is equal to k into q1 q2 by r square where this k has the value 9 into 10 raised to 9 newton meter square per coulomb square so this is the value of k in si so this is the magnitude of force given by coulomb's law later this k was determined to be 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0. This k was determined to be 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 where epsilon 0 is called as permittivity of free space. Epsilon 0 is called as permittivity of free space. Okay, that is what epsilon 0 is. And epsilon 0 has the value 8.854 into 10 raised to minus 12. Newton raised to minus 1, meter raised to minus 2, coulomb raised to minus 2, coulomb raised to plus 2. Okay. Now the law becomes complete by mentioning about the direction also. That means already we know between like charges repulsion and unlike charges attraction. But in what way the direct this force is acting? So according to Coulomb's law, the force acts along the line joining the centers of two charges. It acts along the line joining the centers of two charges. That's what the law says. Okay. Now, so we re, uh, rewind that law. What is Coulomb's law? Coulomb's law. According to Coulomb's law, the force of interaction between the two charges is directly proportional to the product of charges and inversely proportional to the square of distance between the two charges and the force acts in the direction that means along the line joining the centers of two charges. Now the vector form of uh, uh, Coulomb's law and all that we will be discussing in the coming class and one more thing I want to say this Coulomb's law is uh, similar to the law of gravitation what we studied in last year. According to law of gravitation the same way law of gravitation also is stated the force between two masses is directly proportional to product of masses inversely proportional to square of distance between the two masses like that. So in the same way it goes. So this point you know f is inversely proportional to square of distance such forces or such laws we say we say like this that is such forces they obey inverse square law this is a word we usually use in physics so actually electrostatic force and gravitational force they obey inverse square law what do you mean by inverse square law the force is inversely proportional to square of distance between the two charges Okay, so only this much for today's session. The rest of the things that is vector form of Coulomb's force and uh, the problems etc. We will be discussing and more on permittivity we will be discussing in the next session. Thank you.